right. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for hosting me here at your university. It's really been a pleasure to kind of walk around, see some of the labs, and meet some of the professors. Um, to, I'm going to talk to you today about the research that I've done at NC State over the last five years. Uh, as she mentioned, I just defended about two months ago. But I'm also going to talk to you about some of the research that I've done during my internship as well. So the title of my talk is Stimuli Responsive Polymers. And so that's a little buzzwordy, right? That's very general. Uh, but that was done on purpose. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of different systems, a couple of different uh, materials, and how we can use different stimuli in order to generate an ultimate goal. But if we're talking about stimuli responsive polymers, it's sometimes referred to as self-folding polymers, or it's sometimes referred to as polymer origami. Now, the basis of it is in origami engineering. And so this is a somewhat busy slide, but that was done on purpose. And really, the goal of this slide is to convince you that self-folding polymers and stimuli responsive materials can be interesting. Uh, they can be useful, they can be functional, and that there's a wide range of which we can look at. So whether or not we're talking about applications as far reaching as uh, solar arrays, so you can have something very small that you can launch into the Earth's atmosphere and then have it unfold for a, a particular purpose there. Uh, there's some very interesting work going on at MIT where they have these cylindrical type materials that can be immersed um, in solvents or in water and they can fold into furniture-like shapes. There's the more traditional robotics that you can see here in the center. If you have, for example, a small semi-flat robot that can fold up and then scurry away to perform a job, this is closer to polymer origami. If you think about having a collapsed building, for example, and you want it to scurry in to look for what's going on inside of there. And then finally, a new area that's really starting to branch out for origami engineering is in the area of biomedical engineering. So having scaffolds, for uh, example, or even having grippers for biopsy type treatments. There's a lot of different materials that can be used. There's a lot of different stimuli that can be used. And the overarching goal of this is just to convince you that it's interesting. So these are all different materials and different stimuli that we can actually use within these materials. But I want to dive a little bit deeper into the work that I've done during my time as a PhD student. And so I'm going to talk about four separate projects. Three of them are more closely related than the fourth. But the overarching goal of my PhD was to study shape change within polymer materials. So for example, if you start with a flat sheet of polymer, if so you have a sheet of thermoplastic, maybe it's polystyrene, polymethyl methacrylate, the goal is to make this planar material transform into a three-dimensional shape. Maybe it's a cube, maybe it's a sphere for some type of function. But you want to do this in a hands-free way. So the goal is to apply light or heat, some stimulus, so that it folds on its own within a matter of seconds to minutes. So just keep that in mind. That's the overarching theme that ties all of these projects together. So I want to spend the first bit of this time talking about how we can use uh, thin polystyrene sheets and then we can generate folding for interesting shapes. So this is going to be the first project. But I have to explain how we actually do this. So I'm going to dive into the methodology that we're using for the first three projects I'm going to talk about today. So the material we use is a pre-strained polystyrene material. It's actually a very basic material. It's commercially sold as a children's toy. It's known as Shrinky Dinks. Now, um, it's kind of a funny name. Some people remember it. Sometimes you played with it as a kid. Maybe you made charms or bracelets or keychains out of it. But at its base, this material is a pre-strained polystyrene material, and it has a very thin layer of polyvinyl alcohol on the top. The only reason for that, that PVA layer is to make it hydrophilic. So if you take the entire sheet and you uniformly place it into an oven and you heat it above its glass transition temperature, it's going to shrink to half its size. So you can see here we've printed off the NC State logo for some nice propaganda, of course, and then we've just placed it into an oven. So after a few minutes at 120 degrees C, well above its glass transition temperature, it's now half the size of what it started out as. So that's the basis of what we're going to be using, but that's not interesting and that's not exciting for what we want to do. Instead, we need to allow it to locally heat up. So we take these materials and we run it through an inkjet printer, something you have at home, something you have in your office, and we just place black ink onto the surface of that material in a strategic way. Then you can cut out that sample using scissors or a laser cutter. It's relatively simplistic so far. So now we have this little sheet of material, this sample that we've designed carefully. And you place it onto a hot plate at 90 degrees C. The purpose for this is just we want to uniformly heat the sample close to its glass transition temperature, but not quite there. And then we shine an IR light onto the surface of that material. 
Now, when we shine the IR light, what ends up happening is the black ink preferentially absorbs a large amount of that IR light, and the regions that don't have ink do not absorb as much. So what ends up happening is you produce a temperature-induced strain gradient through the thickness of your material. And the material is about 300 microns thick. So we're limited in terms of we just purchase this material, we print on it, cut it out, and now you can make three-dimensional shapes. Um, so now you can go from this small sample into a three-dimensional structure. But the best way to show this really is just to show a video. So that's what I'm going to do now. This is in real time. And to kind of explain what's happening here, we have the two-dimensional design for a cube. Now it's sitting on top of just a glass slide and then a hot plate. So that's what you're going to see. Now as I play the video, an IR light comes across the top. And in real time, it's going to transform into a cube. So it happens very quickly. So we're generating this strain gradient through the thickness of that region where we've placed the ink it's going to play twice through, and you can actually watch it change shape into this three-dimensional structure. OK, so this is exciting. This is, this is good for us. And it was published back in 2011. Um, so that's good. But then we want to do something more than just generate cubes. We want to do something more than generating pyramids, for example. We want to do something useful. So when I joined the group, when I started looking at this project, I wanted to look at how we can change the shape in an interesting and a functional way. So one of the projects I've worked on is generating corrugated surfaces. So this is a side view. You can look at the cross section of one of my samples. The scale bar is provided here. The idea is to go from a flat sheet into this corrugated surface. Now, corrugated surfaces are not new. If you look at corrugated roofs, for example, you haven't changed the material at all. But by changing the geometry, you can play around with the mechanical properties of your resulting material. Now, we do make it just ever so slightly differently from our cubic structure that I showed in the previous slide. If you remember, it all moved upward towards the light. But in this case, we need it to move in multiple directions. So this is referred to as bidirectional folding. What we do is we place the ink on both the top and the bottom surface of that material. Now, because the polystyrene is transparent to the light, you can generate temperature gradients in op opposite directions. So now you can make it fold in multiple directions and generate this bidirectional folding. So now within a matter of seconds, you can go from a flat sheet into an either extensible or a stiff material, depending on which direction you're looking at the mechanical properties. Now, again, the novelty in this work is not that we're making corrugated surfaces, but that we're making corrugated surfaces using light, and we're changing the mechanical properties in a matter of seconds. So we're going to look at it from two different directions. I'm going to look at both extension and compression in terms of analyzing the mechanical properties. And you can start to think of there's a, a huge design space here that we can look at for these materials. So for example, I'm just going to show you quickly and briefly here what it looks like if we start to change the cross-sectional geometry of these materials, whether or not it's triangular, square, trapezoidal, for example. And so now you can see not only the ink pattern that we've used, but next to it, you can also see a physical image of what this sample would look like as well, just to kind of give you an idea. Now, one of the questions is, is if I say that we're changing the mechanical properties, why is it useful and why should you care? Uh, so we, we did a quick little demonstration. And what you can actually see here is this, this is just a sheet of acrylic. So this is just a piece of PMMA. And we've actually super glued four pieces of our polystyrene material to the base of that platform. So now you've got a little platform that can stand on its own. This is the plain, unaltered polystyrene. But if you place some amount of weight onto it, so this is two used chemical engineering textbooks, you can just place it on top of that platform. And you can see it completely buckles. And it can't withstand that amount of weights, a little less than two, two kilograms. Now, however, once we add these corrugations into the materials, we can withstand a much larger amount of weight. Uh, so it can withstand much higher load values. So here we have the exact same acrylic platform, but we've placed four corrugated samples, and we're going to be compressing through the length of that corrugation. So now I had my colleague stand on it for the price of one cup of coffee, and she let me take an image. And now we can see that it can withstand about 50 kilograms. So it's a much higher value. Now, I will say, for imaging purposes, I had her stand on two platforms. But she can stand on just one. And again, we won't see any fatigue or breakage into the materials, just as a nice comparison point. So this is kind of why we're interested in looking at this. So there's two different areas I said I'm going to talk about, one of which is extension. Now, if we're looking at this image, if you can imagine essentially grabbing the two far ends and pulling it outward and extending at a steady strain rate, that's the image that you're seeing on the bottom portion of this slide. So as we move this upper grip in an instron upward at a steady strain rate of 10 millimeters per minute, we can watch the entire thing essentially flatten out 
until we reach a point of breakage, and that's when the sample just breaks on its own. Now, what we actually see is the portions that don't break, they bounce back really nicely. So the interesting part about this is actually looking at the stress-strain curve. So if we look at stress as a function of strain, what we can do is we can repeat this cycle multiple times, and as long as we don't hit that point of breakage, we can actually see this nice repeatability built into the graph. Very little to no hysteresis is seen. So we have this thermoplastic material, and by changing the geometry, we're generating this almost elastic-like response within our materials. So it's interesting looking at it in extension, but of course, you know, we're engineers, we like seeing graphs, we want to see some numbers. So how does it actually change the mechanical properties? Now, if we're looking at an unmodified sheet of this polystyrene, so we have no corrugations built into it whatsoever, and we start to apply a tensile test to this, we can see very high modulus values, but at very low strain, very low fracture strain. But now, once we've added these corrugations, we can extend it, we reach much higher strain rates, um, much higher strain values, and then we lower that modulus uh, by a significant amount. But one of the questions that we had is, what is important, what's an important experimental parameter as you're changing the mechanical properties of these materials? So of course, there's a huge design space that you can start to look within. So this is a somewhat complicated graph. We have load on the y-axis as a function of extension. And so to kind of walk you through, we started looking at how the geometry would change, if you remember from just a few slides ago. I showed how we can change that cross-sectional geometry and look at how it impacts the resulting load displacement curve. So now you can see each one of these graphs is significantly different in terms of its maximum extension value. So what we've been able to determine is if we're looking at purely extension for these structures, it's the cross-sectional geometry that's really the dominating factor when we're looking at these, not the number of corrugations or the length of your material, but actually the geometry itself. Now, there's the other side that we can look at this. If you remember the demonstration where I had my colleague standing on the platform itself, now we're starting to look in compression as opposed to just elongation for these materials. So if we look at an unmodified sheet of material, we can see very low maximum load values. Less than five newtons can be applied before it starts to just bend out of plane. It's very flexible material. However, if you look at actually compressing a corrugated structure, we can reach much higher maximum load values, upwards of 700 newtons. Um, so really, we can increase this by orders of magnitude, but again, we want to know what's important as we're looking at it. If you're looking at this image, really what we mean is that we're compressing through the thickness of this image. So you, if you can imagine having a structure that's very flexible in one direction, can be extended, and then cannot be compressed in the, in the opposite direction. With this graph here, we have, again, load on the y-axis as a function of compression distance. For us, we've switched it up just a little bit to show you what's important on this graph. Here on the right-hand y-axis, we're just increasing the number of corrugations. So here in this image, for example, we see three squares. So this is indicative of a three-crested sample. You can increase that length, decrease that, that length as well. So this makes perfect sense to us. What we're looking at is our maximum load values, which are reaching uh, quite high values. We actually had to go outside of our lab to be able to record these values um, because our lab stopped at about 500 newtons. Um, and so we were very excited. We were hoping to maybe hit 100 newtons on these samples, so this was very promising for us. Um, and really what you start to see is cracks and you start to see breaks. The entire edge essentially just crumbles inward. But the dominating factor in this case is the number of corrugations. It's actually not the cross-sectional geometry that you're looking at. Now, this makes perfect sense to us. As you increase the length of, the, of your material, or if you increase the amount of material that, that you are compressing, you're increasing that surface area ridge. So you would expect for the load to be displaced across a larger area. And so it makes perfect sense that that's going to be your dominating factor to us. So again, the novelty with this project is not that we're making these corrugated surfaces. And it's not that they're improving or changing the mechanical properties, but it's the fact that we can do it very quickly. And now we can have this huge drastic change in the mechanical properties. Imagine being able to ship something to another country. You apply a light for five seconds, and now it's much stiffer than the material that you started with. Being able to ship things efficiently is a huge goal and a huge part of stimuli-responsive work when you're looking at self-folding or remote deployment systems. OK, so that was kind of this this first project that I wanted to touch on was having the ability to take these thin, flexible polystyrene materials and within a matter of seconds change them and have them fold into an interesting three-dimensional structure. In that case, it was very mechanically focused. But 
And the next project that I want to talk about deals with the exact same system, but looking at a drastically different response. And in this case, it's actually curvature. So these look a little bit like snails, I'll admit. Uh, so I'm going to talk about kind of the work that we started with. Now, the reason for this was that when I started in the group and when I started on the project, they had already figured out how to make folds into materials. Right? You print a line onto the structure, now you've got a fold. And so it's very exciting. But if we start looking at nature, for example. So I, I went down to the farmer's market. It's right next to NC State. Bought a sunflower and started looking at it. Okay, now if you look at nature, if you look at the human body, it's not composed of strict, rigid folds. There's curves, there's bends built into our structures. Uh, if you look at softer materials, you can generate bends and curves there as well. So the goal was to try to generate curvature with these thermoplastic materials, which we hadn't done in our system previously. So there's two main places that we sort of picked out curvature and started looking at. The first of which is the stem, right? So it's, it's a very well-known phenomena that for sunflowers, they follow the sun throughout the day. Um, and I'm not a biologist, I'll admit. Um, I don't study plants. But if you're looking at the stem, my understanding is that it acts similar to a bimorph in the sense that portions of the material start to grow faster than others. And that's what allows it to follow the sun throughout the day. That's just a small part of it. Uh, it's also seen in bi bimorph actuators as well. The next place we started looking was, was that the petals of flowers as they that everything sort of starts to grow towards one general direction. So either you have part of the material growing, in our case it would be shrinking because we can't make them grow, uh, or you have everything that's growing, in our case, shrinking. And so that's where we started looking at how we could generate curvature in our system. So if you've been paying attention at this point, chances are the most obvious thing that comes to your mind is just print a gradient of ink, right? So if you print a gradient of ink, then what you're doing is you're allowing portions of the material to heat at different rates, which allows it to generate this curved structure. So I'm going to show you a video here. This is the actual sample. It's just sitting on aluminum foil covering our hot plate. Nothing fancy. Here and on the bottom right-hand corner of all of these videos, you're going to see the ink pattern that we print from our system. So this is what I tell the computer to print onto my material. So it won't be moving with the rest of it. As I play this video, we shine an IR light onto it, and it starts to curve into this nice spiral type shape. So this is, this is exciting for us, but it's not perfect, right? We've got this little kink that appears here in the center. Part of it folds faster than the other part. It doesn't work perfectly. And I would say it's somewhat repeatable in the sense that you will generate curvature. But it's not repeatable in the sense that you're going to have the same radius of curvature ever, for every single one of your samples. So in this case, we were excited that we could generate curvature in thermoplastics, but we wanted to control it a little bit more, and we wanted to understand it. So now we started going back to that idea of a stem. What if you have part of the material grow, or in this case, shrink, and the other part is completely unaffected? In this case, I'm going to be showing you a video where we have 30 millimeters in length and about 10 millimeters in thickness. So what we've done is we've placed the exact same amount of ink onto our material as the previous video. But in this case, we've placed two equal width bands along the far outer length of that material. Again, this is just the ink pattern of what you can see printed right here. So what happens when I play this video is the outer bands start to shrink, and then it's going to bend upward and generate this very interesting snail-like structure. Uh, again, this is all in real time. Now, the beauty to this system is that it's much more repeatable than our previous developed curvature. So we can generate positive curvature built into our system, and it's much more repeatable by really constricting that center portion, which has no ink. But then our next question became, what happens if you inverse that design, right? So now in this case, I have the exact same geometry, the exact same amount of ink, but I've placed ink along the center portion of that material. In this case, right, if you can imagine that, that idea of having one single fold, just a part of that cube that I showed you earlier, you can have one panel lift upward by placing a line. So what's interesting is when we play this video, it's a two-step response. First, it folds over in one direction, and then because it's a biaxially strained material, it will wrap around and generate a resulting structure that has negative curvature. So in this case, it's a slightly, slightly different response. But now we have the ability to generate curvature. It's very reproducible. And we can make both positive and negative curvature from the, the exact same materials simply by strategically choosing where we place that ink. So now if we kind of break this down just a little bit. right? This is, this is a slide that I'll kind of walk you through, where on the top portion here, we just have the ink pattern. This is what I tell the printer to place onto our material. This is an image of what the resulting structure looks like. So we have both our positive and our negative curvature built into our structures. 
Now the center portion that you're going to see here, you're going to see some of these results throughout my presentation. But this is actually a result from a finite element analysis modeling. This was done with a collaborator of mine. So when I started the project, I was working with a student in mechanical engineering, absolutely wonderful student who's now a professor at Auburn University, my undergrad. Uh, so now he's working in the aerospace engineering department there. And so he did all of these, these computational results for me. And in this case, the color is going to indicate the temperature of your material, so whether or not you're above or below the glass transition temperature, because that's really the point where we start to see movement in our materials. So in this case, this is really just showing that as you inverse uh, the design, as you really change that design, you're also changing your resulting structure. But we want to know what happens in between this space. There's sort of this whole area in between that we can look at as well. In this case, if you place a dark gray ink, so 80% ink density in one region, and then 20% ink density in another region, the image is just slightly muted here, but in this case, what we're doing is we're softening, we're darkening the portions that are going to be activated. And then all of the other regions that had no ink now have just a small amount of ink, 20% ink density. And the reason for this is to soften those regions ever so slightly. So now they're open to more movement. You can see how the images actually changed, not very much experimentally. But we do actually see a smaller radius of curvature for our structures that are allowed to fully soften. Here in the center, we sort of see a very random regime where there's no preference for material other than the, the direction that our ink is placed onto the material. So if your ink is placed in one direction, you will bend towards that area, but you don't really have control over what happens in that portion. However, the, the takeaway from this project, the takeaway from this uh, result in this paper was that we can not only generate curvature into our thermoplastic materials, uh, but we can control the direction of that curvature, the degree of the curvature. And this is really heavily dependent on where that ink is placed and how much ink is placed onto the material. So we're trying to isolate those, those several variables within our system. However, I keep talking about curvature and how you should be interested in curvature. It's exciting for opening up the, the design space with which we can work in. But if, I, if you think about curvature, you probably think about an ideally curved surface something like a sphere. But in this case, if we look at a soccer ball, for example, it's composed of, of geometric structures. You've got hexagons and pentagons pieced together to make one spherical structure where you have uniform, uh, uniform curvature throughout the entire material. But what if you wanted to wrap that ball in a single sheet of paper? What if you wanted to make a sphere from one single sheet of paper? Chances are you can't really do it. This is sort of the inverse of the map maker's problem, being able to take a flat sheet of paper, turn it into a sphere, as opposed to taking a sphere and turn it into a flat sheet of paper. So um, it was a challenging problem. And so of course, my advisor said that we should, we should work on that. Um, so I got to work with an absolutely wonderful undergraduate student. Her name is uh, Diana Mongare. And we worked together for a year to try to take our materials and turn them into a sphere. Uh, so out of a lot of studies, basically what we came up with was this type of design. Now, what you can see is two individual circles on either side. And the idea is that these circles would act as individual hemispheres that can sit on top of each other. So they're connected here by a live hinge. And so we have this outer portion here because the center part of your sphere is what has to shrink the most. And then you want the least amount of shrinkage at both the top and the bottom portion of that spherical structure. So they play this video. You're looking at it from the side. One portion will flip over onto the other exactly as it's designed. You see a little bit of ruffling along the edges. And as you continue to expose that IR light to it, it balloons outward into a semi-spherical structure. So this was exciting for us. Um, we really were not sure or thought we were going to be able to generate this type of structure. Uh, so, so this is nice. But then, of course, the first question becomes, well, what are the size constraints? How big can you make it? How small can you make it? Um, and so we have a penny here just for scale. Abraham Lincoln is looking down on all of the samples. Um, some of them are better than others, right? Portions of them uh, have pinch points, for example, once you get into this larger region. Uh, some of them are a little bit more ideal in terms of having a uniform curvature throughout the entire structure. So if I'm honest, we don't fully understand this system just yet, right? We're actually working with uh, a group of computationalists at NC State uh, Dr. Eric Santizo's lab, we're trying to model this together and go back and forth to understand how can you go from, from a flat sheet into a perfectly spherical structure, right? The, the goal, sort of the main end project would be if I can say any shape that I would like to make, how can I go back and design the ink pattern to
to make that happen? How can I design the shrinkage that you need at every single individual point to make this structure? Uh, but it's looking like that might be another student's PhD project um, and not quite mine. All right, so I, I've talked about how we can take this polystyrene and, and generate folding. We can generate curvature, but then, of course, you're probably wondering, um, all right, um, yeah, so, so you're probably wondering what in the world this is useful for and why you should care. Uh, so the final part dealing with polystyrene that I'm going to talk about deals with generating grippers. So of course, I come from Raleigh. It's, it's the city of Oaks. So here we have a gripper that's holding on to an acorn, for example, um, just because it's cute. Now, um, if you'll bear with me, sort of the, the next big, big goal that I want to talk about with this is I've talked about folding and curvature as individual objects and goals. But what if you could combine one single system to have both folding and bending into this more complex design? So if you'll bear with me, this was my original attempt at generating a flower-like structure. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through it. Here we have the ink pattern on the left-hand side. Uh, this is just an image of the experimental results that I would produce. Uh, here and in the center, we have the computational re results. Again, color just indicates the temperature of your material. Now, what you can actually see if we, if we focus in on this lower left-hand side, is that we have a square base right here in the center. Now we have these two, or excuse me, these four lines here, and really the goal of that hinge is to act as a hinge. So each one of these four panels will lift upward, and that's our point of folding. Uh, simultaneously, we have each one of these four panels is designed with an ink pattern so that each panel can simultaneously curve while it's being folded upward. So the idea is to combine folding and curvature into one design. Uh, and the hope is that it will be functional. The hope is that it will be useful. So, so me and, and Russell Malin, who, who is the computationalist on this project, we were so excited when we got these results because they look very similar. Uh, right? But of course, our advisors wanted us to prove that they are very similar. Uh, so what we ended up doing was we had to find a way to take my physical sample. It's very small. It's only well, small to me. It's only about uh, you know, small enough to fit into the palm of your hand. But it's relatively transparent, and it's concave. And we had to find a way to turn this structure into a digital three-dimensional model so that we can now take this digital representation of our experimental sample and set it directly on top of the computational result that Russ was getting. So we essentially embedded my structure into a casting resin, and then we would slice through half a millimeter at a time and do some image analysis to build a three-dimensional model through the serial sectioning technique. So to kind of walk you through, each one of these black dots that you're seeing is an outputted result from the computational model. The rainbow effect that you're seeing here, this is actually my experimental sample. So each color indicates a different layer separated by about half a millimeter. Now as we actually rotate this around, the idea is for you to see how closely our experimental and our computational results line up. How well do they actually match? Um, and so, so we were pretty excited by this. We've sort of pulled out one individual panel so you can see just how closely they match as well. And this was just a nice mental check for us. Our computational output is mimicking what we would see experimentally for a relatively complex design. For us, at the time, this was a relatively complex design. But I promised I would talk about why it's useful. So we generated these gripping-like devices. Okay, so what you can actually see here is this is just one of my samples, and it's sitting on top of a bolt. So something you find at Lowe's, Home Depot, lying around your lab, maybe. Um, but in this case, we've expanded the number of panels. So it doesn't have a square base. In this case, it's a hexagonal base. We have six panels moving outward. Um, and so I'm going to play a video here. But as we play this video, the light will shine down, and each one of these six panels will fold downward and at the same time curve around the object that it's sitting on. So now you can generate a conformal grasp around whatever your targeted object may be. And so now we actually have this wire sitting through the top. So you can come in, you can pick this gripper up, and now you can start to move things around. Uh, it is a tetherless gripper, which is nice. Here you can see one of these grippers wrapped around a bolt, and it's holding on to a roll of tape. So we all know about how much a roll of, of duct tape weighs. This is really just done uh, for demonstrative purposes. And this was our very first attempt at how to make this work. And, and can it pick up something heavier than itself was initially the task. But of course, we want to push it to its limits. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through what's happening here in this image. And this is what the gripper itself looks like. This is a four-paneled gripper 
wrapped around just the head of a bolt here, and we have this wire that's poking through the top of it. So that's how you would lift this gripper up and start to move it around. But in this case, you can see a four-paneled gripper, and then the bolt is screwed into a large block of wood. So essentially, I went to Lowe's, and I got a very large 2 by 4 and started chopping it up. Uh, you paint it red, you put NC State logo on it, and now you've got a variety of different weights. So in this case, we can see a small gripper. It weighs about 0.2 grams. That's about half the weight of a paper clip. But now it can withstand the weight of almost 2 kilograms. So it's significantly more weight than itself. And it can do this for about three days, so about 72 hours before it just mechanically fails. Now we can also just decrease this weight as you move to the right-hand side of the screen. Now the block on the far right-hand side, again, the gripper weighs about 0.2 grams, and it's holding up about 700 grams. So a significantly larger amount of weight than the gripper itself. But the nice part about that system is that it's been in the lab and it has not broken for more than a year at this point. So we're talking about a significant amount of strength built into these materials, but also endurance, uh, right? I believe I hung that gripper up in lab uh, in February of 2018, and it still has yet to break. Um, I will be leaving NC State Tune, and I told them that they can't take it down. I want to see how long it lasts. Uh, it's, it's the longest running experiment in the lab, as far as I'm aware of right now. OK, but you have to get a little bit more scientific, a little bit more particular about it as well. Uh, so I'm going to show you the gripper that we have up here. This is just to kind of remind you what's happening. Uh, but what I'm going to show you now is a video. We have a stress versus strain curve. And the video is going to form, as I'm showing you, we pull upward at a steady strain rate of 10 millimeters per minute. So in this case, you can just watch the gripper in the inchon, and we're pulling upward at a steady rate. So you're going to see the stress begins to increase. And at some point, you're going to see a large drop in a second. And if you watch the video at the same time, what you'll notice right there is that the gripper actually readjusts itself on the head of the bolt. Smaller drops in stress result in smaller readjustments of the gripper on the targeted object as well until it eventually fails right there. And at that point, the gripper is physically being pulled away from the object or it's being sheared through. So there's a couple of different ways that it can fail. But now we can start to understand as we're pulling what's happening. Is the weight just being redistributed on the various parts of the material? Now, of course, we also want to know uh, what's important here, because our best grippers can withstand more than 24,000 times their own weight, uh, which is quite impressive if, if you start looking at some reported values in literature, which are about 1,000 times their own weight uh, for, I would say, a, a standard good gripper. Now, the first one that's important I've already talked about is really the ink pattern. So where are you placing the ink onto that material? Again, here we have just an ink pattern if we look at one individual panel. So I've showed videos for both of these types of, de of designs before. Beneath it, again, we have an output from the computational results. The interesting part about this, though, is that these colors do not indicate temperature. In this case, they indicate shrinkage. We had a hypothesis about uh, at which points is it shrinking more, and how does that in impact its ability to conformally wrap around an object and generate a better overall structure. Now, the next most obvious one that I've pointed out as well from the past couple of slides is how many panels do you have built into your structure? OK, so in this case, I'm going to be showing a load versus displacement curve. And we're going to increase those number of panels from 4 up to 10. And so as you start to change the number of panels, you start to impact how well it can redistribute itself. If we look, for example, at this graph in black here where we have four panels versus the one in green, where we've doubled those numbers of panels, you can see as you decrease the number of panels, you can reach much higher load values, but at much shorter values of displacement. So now we can start to say, what is your resulting application? What are you interested in? And now we can design your gripper based on your targeted goal. And the final part uh, that's it's a little bit more interesting is looking at the geometry of your resulting structure as well. So it's not quite as important as looking at the number of, of panels, but in this case, I'll walk you through what these graphs really mean. Here we have a contour plot. On the left-hand side of both of these graphs, you're going to see how we can change the panel geometry. So is it triangular? Is it trapezoidal, rectangular, for example? It, it really goes back to geometry. And then on the x-axis here, we're changing the number of panels. Now just for, for clarity to make sure that you can visualize what's happening here, we've placed the ink pattern for each one of these designs directly on top of the point at which it sits on the graph. So you can see the, the actual structure that's putting out that result. 
On the far right-hand side, we're showing a maximum load, so you can see how the color indicates maximum load. We would like to see large values of red. Uh, ideally, this would be completely red. Um, however, what we're able to see for both of these graphs is that the most dominant factor in this case is the number of panels. If you look, for example, although we've changed the panel geometry, in this case, they all output relatively similar maximum load values. Uh, so in this case, we're able to see this is somewhat confusing, but the most important factor is the number of panels. So now we can start to apply for various different applications. We can pick up different objects, a variety of objects as well. Uh, if you remember, I showed an acorn just earlier on. Okay, uh, so I've spent a lot of time talking about polystyrene and talking about relatively thin materials. For us, they're about um, 0.3 millimeters in thickness. And it's all been the same system with how we generate this change in shape. So it's, it's, a, it's a photothermal response. And it's relatively simple in nature how we can make these structures. Uh, so I, I hope I've been able to convince you that, that there's a range of things that we can do with this. But the very last project I want to talk about, we're going to shift gears completely. Now, the, the overarching goal will stay the same. We still want to generate a change in shape for these materials. We want to go from a flat sheet or a flat structure into a three-dimensional shape. So in this case, um, I'm going to talk about, you're going to see a lot of blue throughout these images. Um, but this is the work that I did during my internship. So um, through the NSF and through the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, uh, I went to the Laboratory of Soft and Wet Matter. And so there I spent about five months working in this lab who deals primarily with double network hydrogels. And they deal with a lot of gel materials uh, at its base, but there's a small subsection of the group that's working on composite structures and on changing uh, the mechanical properties of structures by combining them. So this is just a simple image of the material that I produced when I was in Japan. So I'm going to kind of walk you through it. Here at the top portion here, we have PDMS. So this is just Dow Corning's Silgard 184. It's produced to manufacturer specifications. Uh, in Japan, it is referred to as Silpot 184, in case you're curious. Uh, along the bottom portion here, we have a hydrogel. This is actually a polyamphalite hydrogel. That's why it says PA in front of it. Um, and really, they are the experts in this material that we've been working with. But uh, there's this sort of an interesting area of research right now where people are trying to combine hydrogels and elastomers into composite structures. Uh, but a lot of people are using chemical approaches, for example. Um, and so we wanted to take a step back and look at just a physical approach to actually adhere these materials. So this is not a bilayer composite. This is actually a tri-layered system. Here in the center, you can see this little cross hatching there. And that cross hatching is actually a glass fiber fabric material. It's just an, an e-weave textile. It's about 0.6 millimeters in thickness. And each one of these gel layers is one millimeter in thickness on both the top and on the bottom. So this project had two main goals, first of which was generate the composite structures. Uh, so there was a system in place where they've been making these fabric reinforced composite materials, uh, but they've never combined two materials with the fabric. So that was the first goal of the project. The second goal was to apply stimuli responsiveness, right, to make them move. Uh, but I don't expect you to just believe me when I say that this is PDMS here and this is hydrogel here. Uh, so we did some SEM EDX just to confirm that we're saying ex exactly what we expect to see. In this case, we've highlighted all of the silicon-containing regions in green. So we do have polydimethylsiloxane sitting here. We expect that to be green. Now, the center portion here is our glass fiber fabric. You can actually see two separate bundle layers. So this is a bundle of glass fibers. And then this is another bundle. They are going to be perpendicular because it is a woven textile. On the bottom portion here, we've highlighted all of our sulfur-containing regions in blue. So the anionic monomer of our hydrogel contains sulfur, and that's what we would expect to see. So this was a nice mental check for us that we actually have what we say we have. Um, if you're interested in the polyamphalite hydrogel that I use, there's an absolutely wonderful Nature Materials paper out of the group uh, where they discuss it and do a lot of studies, more fundamental studies on the material itself. Um, but, you know, of course, if you're generating a, a composite, you want to see how it changes the mechanical properties of, of that resulting composite. So one of the things we did was a tearing force test. So here I have a graph where on the y-axis we see the tearing force, and on the x-axis we have the displacement. 
So essentially, if you have this rectangle of your material, you just cut a notch, grab the two ends, and then pull separately at 180 degrees. So in this case, we're going to just tear through the material. But if you look at any of the individual materials, just the hydrogel, just the elastomer, or just the fabric, then you're going to see very low maximum tearing forces. You're going to max out at maybe 5 newtons. Now, once we combine this into a trilayered structure, and then we start to pull it apart, we see a much higher maximum tearing force by an order of magnitude. So the graph here in red indicates our composite structure, and the other colors indicate the individual materials themselves. So this is nice. This is what we want to see. We want to see uh, this nice improvement in our materials. Um, and then if you are generating a laminate, then you also have to start looking at uh, the work of adhesion as well. So we have work of adhesion versus displacement where you can either peel away the hydrogel from the glass fiber fabric, or you can peel away the elastomer from the glass fiber fabric and look at that as well. This was just a nice mental check for us to say that we are actually adhering the materials in a way that we say we are, um, and that we're actually seeing significant uh, robust adhesion between our structures, so they won't delaminate the second we start to try to use them. Okay, now, I told you my favorite part, the part that I'm interested in, is making them move and making these materials do something interesting. Uh, so I'm going to show you a GIF and I'm going to kind of walk you through what's happening with our materials. In this case, we've placed one of our structures just, it's attached to a binder clip here and it's placed in a beaker of acetone. Uh, so you can see acetone is here. Now, this is a GIF where we're going to increase the time from zero to 10 minutes. So this is just our time stamp moving on the top. Now, what happens is as you continue to place it to acetone, um, and as it's continuously exposed to this, the PDMS is going to swell. Simultaneously, your hydrogel is going to de-swell. So we have our, our PDMS is sitting up here on the top. We have our hydrogel along the bottom. And then this simultaneous swelling and de-swelling is allowing the entire structure to bend downward. Uh, now, the beautiful part about this system and about using solvent-based actuation is that it's reversible. So you take that sample, you place it out of acetone, and you put it directly into DI water. In this case, that PDMS is going to de-swell. Hydrogel is going to re-swell to its original state. And now you've gotten this flattened out structure. It's able to recover its initial shape. Um, again, we just want to do a nice mental check. So I'm going to show you a plot where we have the radius of curvature on the y-axis as a function of time. All of our timestamps allow us to swell for 10 minutes at a time. So what we would see is that the radius of curvature should be decreasing as we continuously expose it to acetone. Uh, we use a modified form of the Temeschenko equation, um, and so we're starting to see some good agreement between uh, that calculation and our experimental results. We are breaking a couple of assumptions with this modified form of the equation, but for us, it's just a nice mental check to say we should expect to see it decrease, and indeed it does. Um, but of course, if I do say that it's cyclic, then I need to be able to show you that it does cycle multiple times. So here I have a graph where we're showing the angle of rotation on the y-axis. And then we have time on the x-axis. So if we place the sample in acetone for 10 minutes, and then water for 10 minutes, and then acetone for 10 minutes, and we go back and forth, what you would expect to see is an increase followed by a full recovery when we place it back in water. Now, the angle of rotation is different from your radius of curvature, which was shown on the previous slide. In this case, the angle of rotation is this angle out to the trailing edge with respect to its horizontal initial state when it was in a planar state. So in this case, you would expect to see the angle of rotation increase in acetone and then fully recover in water. So we were excited when we got this plot to see it fully recover. But of course, the first questions uh, that reviewers ask when you try to publish a paper is four doesn't seem like a whole lot of cycles. So you should probably increase that to more right? if you're going to make any claims about cyclic ability. So we started increasing this up to 20, 40 cycles. Uh, in this case, you can see the structure in its initial state. It is flat here. And then after you've gone through 20 cycles, we can see it in its activated state when it's swollen into a curved structure. Same thing again with 40 cycles. Now, not only can we say it bends and it recovers at this point, but one of the biggest questions that you're going to get when you're dealing with these composites is whether or not you're seeing any delamination into your materials as well. So we took a structure and we placed it in acetone for 80 minutes. At this point, it's eight times the length that it would normally sit in acetone for one of our standard tests. We see slight amounts of uh, delamination here in the corners. Uh, but other than that, we are still seeing our composite sitting as one overall structure. We aren't seeing any significant delamination, and so we're pretty happy with that as it stands now. 
Now, if you're kind of, kind of thinking through how we're activating these materials, we're swelling one side, de-swelling the other, the question starts to become, well, can you bend it in the opposite direction? I've talked about curvature. I've talked about wanting to increase our design space in terms of a three-dimensional structure. So our next goal was to generate a triple state actuator, being able to exist in three states. So this is what our structure looks like in TI water, in the as-prepared state. I've already shown that we can swell it in acetone, allow it to curve. Uh, this is a very lightly curved structure, but this is simply for demonstrative purposes. And then it can fully recover into this flat state in DI water. Now, the next thing that you can do is you can swell the hydrogel and not make any changes whatsoever to that PDMS. You just place it in a two molar salt solution for us, and we can generate curvature in the opposite direction. So now you can exist in multiple different states and you can move through this cycle. Uh, there are some other ways that we can actuate this as well. We can either place it in vacuum just to remove the water from our hydrogel. Uh, we can change the solvent, maybe place it in THF as opposed to acetone. And so all of these are different areas where we can start to look at changing the overall shape for applications like maybe grippers or artificial muscles. There's a range with which we can do this. Okay, so I, I hope that I've been able to kind of convince you uh, through a couple of different projects that stimuli responsive materials are interesting and we can make some interesting functionalization with these materials, apply useful things, um, and there's a range of shapes that we can make, materials that can be used, and even stimuli that we can apply to these materials to make them change their shape into something useful. Um, I am a part of two research groups at NC State, so I just want to take a brief second and thank them. The first one uh, is the lab of Professor Michael Dickey, so this is Dr. Dickey right here in the center. Um, I'm also part of the lab of Professor Jan Genzer, and so this is him right here. Um, he's, he's got a fun personality. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with four undergrad students and mentored one high school student as well throughout my time at NC State, and this has been funded by the NSF, primarily through the Graduate Research Fellowship. Um, I also did spend five months at Hokkaido University, so this was the very last project that I talked about. Uh, and so this is a much larger version of a group. However, this is only part of the group that was there at the time. So this was headed under the PI, Professor Jen Ping Gong, um, and my assistant professor was Professor Daniel King at uh, Hokkaido University, and this was funded through the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Uh, so if you have any questions, I would love to take those now.